there, and welcome to In Their Own Words, the story of the American experiment in the words of the people who made it happen. Hi, I'm your host, Pete Fenzel, and we're delighted that you chose to spend some time with us today in this episode. This episode is going to be about Thomas Paine and the times that tried men's souls. Thomas Paine was a very flawed man under the, in the estimation of the people of his time. It's only been in the 20th century and in the 21st century that his reputation has been restored. So let's take a look for a few minutes at the life and the story of Thomas Paine and his words and why they are worth knowing. He was born in 1737 in England to a family of very modest means. His father was a corset maker and he attended school till he was about 12 years old and then apprenticed to his father to make corsets, a job which he absolutely hated. He ran away from home twice, the second time to go to sea on a British privateer uh, to attack French commerce during the Seven Years' War. They didn't do it very well. They were probably one of the most incompetent privateers in the British fleet. In any event, he, he came ashore penniless. He tried for a while teaching English, then that didn't do much for him. Then he tried the Methodist ministry, and he was no good at that whatsoever. Finally, he wound up as a tax collector, collecting customs duties for the government. And he was fired twice from that job. First, because he was a whistleblower against the corruption of his superiors, and second, when he wrote a public essay to Parliament explaining why tax collectors should be paid much better. This job taught Tom three things. One, how thoroughly corrupt government service was. Two, how thoroughly hated tax collectors were. And three, how thoroughly resourceful people were to evade paying customs duties. Well, he was married at age 22, and in short order, his, his dear wife and his baby both died in childbirth. And here he was now alone in the world, penniless again, and bereft of the people he loved most. He tried establishing a business as a grocer and a tobacconist, and married 12 years later, a girl much younger than he was. And when his business went bankrupt, she disappeared for greener pastures. So here was Tom Paine now, 37 years old, alone again, penniless again, not having yet discovered his prodigious talents. But he had a very curious and keen mind, and he used to frequent bookstores in London. He would meet people of thought and issues there, and he would attend lectures on scientific matters which brought him into the circle with an introduction to Benjamin Franklin, who was serving in London at the time as the colonial agent for the American colonies to Parliament. Well, Franklin must have seen something remarkable about this guy and his, and his brain and his powers of thought and his expression, because he invited Tom Paine to emigrate to, the, to America and even paid his passage to Philadelphia with a letter of introduction to his son-in-law, Robert Bache. Well, Payne landed in Philadelphia November 30th, 1774, and immediately was brought to the attention of the largest bookseller in Philadelphia, Robert Aitken. And Aitken was about to establish a new publication called the Pennsylvania Magazine. Quickly, he became familiar with Payne. And he liked what he saw a lot, and he made Payne the editor of this new publication, and it was a fantastic success, in large part because of the many articles Payne wrote himself. Now, one of those articles was about African slavery in America, an indictment of the slave trade, and a an call for the immediate emancipation of the African peoples who had been captured and brought to the, to the American continent. This endeared him to some people, 
but he was hated by many others. Here he was in this new land, prosperous, esteemed, working at something that he loved and was really great at. For the first time in his life, Thomas Paine was a success and admired by his peers. Then came April 19th, 1775, where British soldiers fired upon American farmers at Lexington and Concord, and everything changed. Paine was outraged. He loved his new country. And the fact that the British monarchy and the British aristocrats would be willing to murder Americans in order to maintain their power and tyranny over them turned Thomas Paine into a radical supporter of the American cause. Now, he kept thinking about the issue at hand and became convinced quickly that there was no way of reconciling with the tyrant. And so Paine was developing in his mind the outline of an essay promoting the independence of the American colonies. And for him, independence meant a colonial continental union where a republican form of government would be created to protect the rights of individual citizens. And he started writing in about November of 1775. Now during the second half of 1775, King George III had done just about everything to alienate the American people. But there were still very many who hoped for reconciliation. In the new essay that Paine was writing, he, attend, he intended to call plain truth at the suggestion of that great patriot, Dr. Benjamin Rush, he called it common sense. And so common sense it was. And it was a 47 page pamphlet that treated on the stupidity of monarchy and hereditary power of the need for a Republican form of government and the protection of the rights of individuals. The pamphlet was published on January 10 of 1776 and immediately became a fantastic success. Within several weeks, over 100,000 copies had been sold. And out of his dedication to the cause of America, he donated all profits and all future royalties to the Continental Congress, making not one penny for himself. And when other publishers tried to publish the, the article, he allowed them to do so without complaint because he wanted the words to get out to as broad an audience as possible. And Paine made absolutely nothing for all of his efforts. This pamphlet of 47 pages called Common Sense, was read by just about every single American who could read. And back then, we only had two and a half million people in the country. It was read at every dinner table, in every tavern, in every coffee shop, at every public space, at every town meeting. It was even read in churches and sermonized upon. It was a really big deal. And it persuaded thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Americans to abandon any hope of reconciliation and to embrace the cause of independency. As a matter of fact, George Washington himself, on April 1st of 1776, wrote to his adjutant, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Reed, to that effect as follows. My countrymen, I know, from their form of government and steady attachment heretofore to royalty, will come reluctantly to the idea of independency. But time and persecution brings many wonderful things to pass. And by private letters which I have lately received from Virginia, I find common sense is working a powerful change there in the minds of many men. The effect of common sense upon the American mind was immediate and profound. In fact, when the Continental Congress appointed five men to draft the language for the Declaration of Independence, they consulted Thomas Paine in the process. Now, Paine was not a member of Congress, and this was supposed to be a secret committee. 
but they borrowed heavily from the language of common sense and employed the services of Payne to provide suggestions for editing the draft, the early drafts at least, of the Declaration. After independence had been declared, Payne went on to volunteer in the Continental Army as a civilian secretary and aide to General Nathaniel Green, who was the commander of Fort Lee on the New Jersey Palisades. Now there were two forts at that point, both at which, one in Manhattan and one on the Jersey side, at about the same spot where the George Washington Bridge is now located. The one in Manhattan was called Fort Washington, the one on the Jersey Palisades was called Fort Lee, and the two forts were combined to interdict British warships from traveling up the Hudson River. Fort Washington was overrun on November 16 of 1776, which made Fort Lee pointless. And a large British force under Cornwallis landed at the Palisades and by, guided by Tories found a hidden cart path up the Palisades not too far from the fort. Since Fort Lee was no longer useful, the fort was abandoned and the American retreat across New Jersey began. The remnant of the Continental Army that crossed the Delaware uh, on the 9th of December of 1776 was fewer than 3,000 men. That army had started at over 20,000 men, was beaten at the Battle of Long Island, then they fled across the East River into Manhattan. They were forced to flee Manhattan up to White Plains and the British Army beat them at White Plains again. Then they had to cross the Hudson River and come down into Bergen County to Fort Lee and to Hackensack and then had to fly across New Jersey. It took them three weeks to make the 100 miles across the, uh, the Delaware River. Payne himself shouldered his musket in the process. It was during this retreat across New Jersey that Payne wrote by the light of a campfire perhaps his greatest and most influential words. These words would coalesce in a seven-page pamphlet entitled The American Crisis, the first of 13 issues that were written over the course of the entire Revolutionary War. The American Crisis was published in Philadelphia on December 19th of 1776, all the while George Washington was planning the last stroke of what was left of his army before the army itself dissolved. Because all the enlistments of the men was, were going to expire on December 31st. And it was very unlikely that the army would survive and endure after these enlistments ran out. Anyway, George Washington got a hold of a copy of the American crisis and was staggered by the words that he read. He was energized and called his officers in and ordered all of them to read this seven-page pamphlet to every single soldier in the Continental Army. And so this was done on December 23rd of 1776, only two days before the assault on Trenton. And the words that fill the hearts of his countrymen are as follows. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to set a proper price upon its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. He goes on for seven more pages. But the effect upon the Continental Army was like a lightning strike. 
On Christmas night of 1776, only grim and fierce men crossed the Delaware River choked with ice through sleet and snow and marched through blood-stained snow to Trenton to attack the Hessian outpost there. The, the British had gone into winter quarters both at Trenton where there were about 1,500 Hessians and there was a larger British force just opposite Philadelphia along the uh, Delaware River of about 10,000 redcoats under the command of Cornwallis. That force caused the Continental Congress to flee Philadelphia for Baltimore. And Washington had written to his brother uh, a few days before that it, it looked like the game was over for America. But as dawn broke, on the morning of December 26th of 1776, these grim and fierce men attacked the Hessian outpost at Trenton. And losing only two or three men in the battle, one of whom was wounded uh, was James Monroe, who became the fifth president of the United States. And they defeated the Hessians, taking over 900 out of the 1,500 prisoners. Then they went north up to Princeton and, and repeated their achievement. And the result of all of this was that many men re-enlisted. The American army was saved and they would go on and endure through seven more years of war until they emerged victorious and our independence was secured. All during the rest of the war, Payne continued service at various functions for the country. And by war's end in 1783, Payne was penniless. He had no home, he had no wife, he had no children, he had no money. He was penniless without any prospects, despite all the service he had performed for America. New York State, however, became mindful of Payne's service to his country and of his need. And they donated to Thomas Paine a 300 acre farm in New Rochelle in Westchester County. And Paine lived on that farm for several years after the war. But around 1787 he went back to Europe. He went to London and met with some of the parliamentarians who had supported the American cause like Edmund Burke and he also went over to Paris to renew his friendship with the Marquis de Lafayette and was introduced around the revolutionary circles in France. Remember the Bastille was stormed on July 14, 1789 and the French Revolution was on. Paine was an enthusiastic supporter of the French Revolution. And in America, those who supported the Jeffersonian uh, wing of American politics were also delighted with the French Revolution. The other political party then were the Federalists, and they were deadly opposed to the French Revolution. By supporting it, Thomas Paine alienated about half of the country. Edmund Burke had written an essay uh, against the French Revolution, and in doing so, he praised the, the hereditary monarchy and hereditary aristocracy of Britain. Now, that was like waving a red flag to a bull before Thomas Paine, who was vehemently opposed to monarchy and aristocracy, and especially of the hereditary kind. And so he wrote The Rights of Man as a refutation of Burke's writings. Well, Burke made his reply, and Paine made his sir reply by the second part of the rights of man, which became even more virulent, more direct, and more hostile to monarchy, and in this case to the monarchy of Great Britain and to the peerage. It also attacked the conventional system, suggesting that there be a progressive income tax against the wealthy rather than a regressive income tax, usage taxes against the poor, and promoted social welfare programs for the indigent. 
Well, you were hitting the British establishment in the pocketbook, and so you became a, a real threat. A, a warrant for the arrest of Thomas Paine went out, charging him with seditious libel, which means that you said something that the king didn't like, and he really would like to see you dead. Well, only 20 minutes or so before the arrest warrant could be served upon Paine, he had fled on board ship and sailed to Calais in France and avoided being arrested and executed in Britain. The effect in France made him even more a celebrated revolutionary. And he was elected by the people of Calais to the French National Convention, even though he couldn't speak French. The monarchy was deposed. King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were imprisoned. And there was a movement afoot to have them executed by the guillotine. The Jacobins under Maximilien Robespierre were a bloodthirsty lot, and they wanted to see as many royalists and aristocrats murdered as they possibly could, and including any common person who sympathized with them or against whom they had a, a grudge. Well, Paine was very much in favor of the abolition of the aristocracy and the ending of the monarchy in favor of a republican form of government in France. But he earned the hatred and the fear of the Jacobins by being vehemently against executing Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. He argued to them that you're going to lose the sympathy of, of all of America if you do this. And they arrested Payne, and they were going to execute him too. As a matter of fact, he was in there for a year, and his health was broken. And it was during this time that he wrote another essay, and that was also in, in two parts. Well, when his writ of execution was issued, the guards who were supposed to come to his cell bypassed his cell and went and picked up somebody else instead of him. It just so happened that three days after he was supposed to be executed, they executed Robespierre instead. And once Robespierre was gone, the reign of terror, the worst of the reign of terror at least, was largely in the past. It took a little while, but eventually Payne was released from prison. His health was completely shattered, and he was rather bitter against George Washington for not getting him out sooner, for all the suffering that he endured and the fear that he endured. And one, one can really sympathize with him that the, uh, the, tr the trauma and the stress that he endured in prison must have changed the man. Because in the past, with the issue of common sense, he was reasonable and he used plain, simple language, logic, and cogent persuasion in simple terms to try to convince the American people that independence was the right course to take. But once he got out of prison, he seemed not willing to persuade with not just with logic but with reasonable language. And he became virulent and he was more interested in stating the unvarnished truth as he believed it rather than trying to persuade people. And so he became more radical and less persuasive. And he lost the uh, affections of the other half of the American people who still clung to him. Indeed, perhaps the only person in America who still esteemed Thomas Paine was Thomas Jefferson, who invited him to the White House to dinner when he made it back to America in 1802. By then, the generation of the men of, and women of the Revolution had either gone to their eternal rewards or had become very old and were no longer engaged very much in public affairs. A new generation had taken over who were totally unfamiliar with both the, the gifts that Payne had, had given to the country and the sacrifices that he had made on behalf of our struggle for independence. And so, they shunned this radical person, this person whom they considered an atheist, because it was essentially a broadside against organized religion in general and against Christianity in particular. America was almost exclusively around that time a Protestant country with various Protestant denominations holding sway. And pain was obviously a threat to the existing order in, in America, so he was detested. 
and the poor fella was now living in squalor in New York City. He was again penniless, he was again friendless, and he, whatever good had he ever done, any fame he ever had was forgotten by people who couldn't care less. He was befriended only by one woman in Manhattan who allowed him to stay at her place during his last days. And he died at her home on Grove Street in, in New York City in 1809. And yet, not a single graveyard in New York City was willing to take the corpse of Thomas Paine. They detested him. For that reason, Paine's body was interred up in New Rochelle on his farm. And one would hope that this would be the end of the story, but it's not. Misfortune was not through with the poor fella. Ten years later, in 1819, some nitwit of a journalist decided to dig up Tom Paine's body and bring it over to Britain to create a shrine uh, criticizing basically the corruption in the Church of England and the corruption of the British monarchy and peerage. So th this ridiculous scheme never came about. And Tom Paine's bones were lost someplace. Nobody knows what happened to them. So the poor fellow doesn't even have a grave to mark his passage. And during the rest of the 1800s, nobody cared a hoot about Thomas Paine. And it wasn't until the early 20th century that his scholarship started rediscovering his writings and his significance to the American cause. So, why should we care now about Thomas Paine? Well, why should we care now about his writings? How does it impact the story of the American experiment? Well, independence is one of the big consequences of his writings. It went very, very far to change the minds of thousands upon thousands of, of well-meaning Americans in favor of independence. And the second was the survival of the American military resistance to the British at the Battle of Trenton. So there's three reasons in my mind why we should memorialize and remember Thomas Paine. One, out of a decency of gratitude for what he did for the country and us. Second, to uphold the virtues and the values which he, his deeds represented, the truth of the value of a Republican form of government protecting the rights of the people and a rejection of the notion that some arbitrary inherited nobleman had the right to oppress us. And three, as an encouragement for others to do likewise. For you younger Americans and you newer Americans, even for those of you who just didn't know too much about Tom Paine before, would you be willing to give up everything you loved? Would you be willing to give everything away to tell the unvarnished truth about great matters of which you were the most passionate. If you are, then you share the spirit of Thomas Paine. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you didn't, well, thanks for stopping by and have a nice life. But if you did enjoy this episode and all the other episodes from In Their Own Words, I'd like to ask you a little kindness on your part. So far, we have reached dozens of people through this series. We should be reaching thousands of people because kids are not getting this information in their schools. They're not getting it in the movies, on TV, on the internet. They're not even getting it at the dinner table anymore. They're not getting it from popular culture. And the only place where people are gonna find out the story, the magnificent story of the American experiment is by these types of series with people like you by word of mouth spreading the word. And so if you would please do the simple kindness, it'll only take a minute or two, that if you do enjoy these episodes and if you think that they are worthwhile, copy the internet address, the URL for this page on, on YouTube and just copy and paste it, put it into a, an email, send it to a dozen of your friends or a dozen people that you think might benefit from seeing these episodes. And hope, we hope that uh, by doing this, the numbers will swell by word of mouth even further, and that they will go on and do the same thing to their friends. 
And so we can spread the word about this magnificent republic and the wonderful stories of heroism and decency and virtue which built the greatest and last hope of mankind on the face of the earth. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll tune in for the next time. We're going to do the Alamo the next, which should be interesting for everybody. So please wait for the next episode too. God bless you.